Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Newey St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, New East St. Augustine. I presume that Albert Einstein read this supercomputer story that was in the January 11, 1946 issue of the New York Times. On that date, Albert Einstein was 66 years old. I was living in living outside New York City. Parallel Processing was first published as a science fiction back on February 1, 1922, and I discovered it as a science fact on the 4th of July, 1989. During the 67 years on of 1922, the parallel supercomputer was marked as a science fiction because the then unproven technology was rejected by the leading minds in supercomputing, great acclaim greeted my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing. My experimental discovery was the lockdown evidence that proved that the old paradigm of sequential supercomputing should be abandoned. My discovery occurred on the 4th of July, 1989 the date that I solved the toughest mathematical problem and not only solved it across the slowest ensemble of processors, but solved it at the fastest speed in the history of the computer. For that reason, I became the first person to give a complete and definitive demonstration of practical parallel supercomputing, as well as record my new knowledge across a lengthy series of videotapes that are posted at mrvalley.com and on youtube.com. Back in the 1980s, I was surrounded by 16 formidable, massively parallel supercomputers. Because message passing or programming 64 binary thousand processors via emails, was then in the realm of science fiction. I was the lone wolf programmer of those 16 supercomputers. In the 1980s, the message passing of initial boundary value problems was called a grand challenge because it scared all the 25,000 vector supercomputer programmers away. I programmed those 16 parallel supercomputers alone because I was the only person that had the courage, expertise, and the confidence to tackle the grand challenge problem alone. My mastery of that parallel supercomputer is the reason I was the subject of newspaper articles and the reason I am the subject of inventor biographies. What does it take to invent a new computer that is also a new internet? Parallel processing is the primary determinant in the power of the supercomputer. The inventor of the massively parallel supercomputer must have the tenacity to reach the frontier of human knowledge as well as the audacity to absorb and digest encyclopedic information. That supercomputer inventor must be at home at the frontiers of knowledge of physics, mathematics, and computer science. It took me 15 years from my first reading of a science fiction story on Jurai's parallel processing to my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing, 
That discovery occurred on the 4th of July, 1989. That science fiction story that was published on February 1, 1922, was about 64,000 human computers that encircled the globe or the earth and that worked together to forecast the weather for the whole globe. I reimagined that science fiction story as parallel supercomputing across a new internet that is a new global network of two raised to power 16 processors that I visualized as encircling a globe in a 16 dimensional mathematical hyperspace. In retrospect, the rejections of my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred during the 15 years that preceded July 4, 1989, helped me to grow as a research supercomputer scientist and helped me to refine my invention. After a decade of reformulating, recording, and rewriting, my research report on parallel supercomputing grew to 1,057 pages. My research report of parallel supercomputing began as a few pages and began in 1980 in Washington, D.C. My research report began not, uh, not as a not so fully formed partial differential equations of calculus that has its companion partial dif difference equations of algebra as well as, as its companion extreme scale computational fluid dynamics code that I expected to parallel process across a new internet that would be a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that will become one cohesive virtual supercomputer that is not a computer per se, but that is an internet de facto that emulates the world's fastest computer. I began supercomputing and I and began on the first computer to be rated at the speed of 1 million instructions per second back when it was manufactured in December 1965. I began supercomputing. I began programming that supercomputer on June 20, 1974 at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Governors, Oregon, United States. In 1980, I could only produce a few pages on parallel processing. Those initial few pages of 1980 of parallel processing grew into a 1057-page report on how I discovered practical parallel processing and discovered it as the vital technology that will power every supercomputer. I was the first person to use as many as 65,536 commodity of the shell processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that shared nothing between each other, and used them to cooperatively solve a grand challenge initial boundary value problem arising in mathematical physics, and used them to perform the world's fastest computation and perform it while solving a grand challenge problem. I made that discovery on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, and I reported that discovery in a 1,057-page research report that was abstracted as a 40-page research report that won the top prize in supercomputing. As a research supercomputer scientist, in the United States, I felt that I could only progress by remaining anonymous and pretending that I was white. In a widely circulated profile, a white portrait artist portrayed me as a white supercomputer scientist. The reason for my passing as white was that my discovery that parallel supercomputing is faster than vector supercomputing was only accepted 
were members of the Prize Committee of the IEEE Computer Society, presumed that I was white. Back in the 1970s and 80s, some white scientists openly expressed their beliefs that blacks are less intelligent than whites. That was the primary reason I conducted my research alone. Back then, the prominent American physicist William Shockley was in the news for his support of the eugenics movement that was aimed to suppress the black gene pool. William Shockley contributed the sperm to a sperm bank, bank that was developed to spread the genes of intelligent white men. William Shockley proposed to pay black men to undergo voluntary sterilization. More recently, a prominent scientist, James Watson, said that blacks are less intelligent than whites. William Shockley and James Watson Many said on television what many white scientists will say in their bedrooms. The stereotype was that white men can't run and black men can't swim. Thomas Jefferson, the third US president, in his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, noted that it would be difficult to find a black person that could understand the abstract works of Euclid. Euclid is the father of geometry. Thomas Jefferson was not aware that Euclid lived 2,300 years ago and in a predominantly black city in Africa. As far as we know, Euclid never traveled outside Africa. There is no proof that Euclid is not a person of African ancestry. I'm often asked to explain how parallel supercomputers benef benefit you. That's like asking, what will the world be like without the parallel supercomputer? That world would be a world that would be a world in which 99 of the 100 processors inside your computer is turned off. You are then computing at 1% of your current capacity and perhaps achieving only 1% productivity level. A new supercomputer without parallel processing is reduced to the stature of an ordinary computer. A new supercomputer that is not parallel processing is like your hometown with only one street light on. A world without the massively parallel supercomputer is a world in which fewer discoveries are made. Innovation is slowed down, human progress is slowed down, and the computer of tomorrow cannot be invented today. The bird sings the same song as its ma and pa. Human progress occurs when we sing a better song than our ma and pa. Thank you. Insightful and brilliant lecture.